who is a CFA. Ryan serves as the managing partner and team lead at Sierra Pacific Wealth Management. Previously, Ryan served as Senior Vice President, Senior Portfolio Manager, and Team Lead of the Sierra Pacific Group at Morgan Stanley. Ryan started his career in wealth management at Edward Jones, where he grew to be the largest producer in the country for his length of service. In 2020, Ryan was named to the Forbes Top 20 Best in State Wealth Advisors for Nevada. Ryan has over 12 years of industry experience and is a certified financial planner, holding Series 7 and Series 66 licenses, as well as all lines of insurance. Prior to the wealth management industry, Ryan spent 12 years on active duty, serving as a naval aviator, logging nearly 3,000 flight hours and 256 carrier landings. Ryan fully retired honorably from the United States Navy in 2017. And if you haven't yet seen Ryan's recent talk um, just this week on the economic impact of the war uh, in Ukraine, I highly urge you to view it. It is posted to our YouTube channel and it's really excellent. Ryan graduated from Trinity, <clears throat> excuse me, Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas with a BS in finance and economics. He completed his graduate work at Harvard Business School and is an active member of the HBS Alumni Association. And of course, Ryan has been giving presentations for the UCSD Retirement Association for well over 12 years now. He is part of our special cadre of preferred professional providers who are people we consider to be the best in their field and who give excellent community service uh, presentations to our members. Each month, Ryan presents a new topic for our monthly <clears throat> investment interest group, which happens on the fourth Tuesday of each month from 12 to 1 p.m. Let's all welcome now Ryan Hista. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, everyone. Uh, can someone just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay out there? Yes. Get your video on? Okay, great. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Suzanne. I uh, apologize for being a minute late there. Sometimes uh, <laughs> nature calls right as you're about to start a presentation, but it happens. Uh, I'm sure for the professors out there, that's probably happened before as well. You think you're ready to go and then uh, you have to go. Anyhow, um, thank you everyone for joining today. We've got a nice big group here. Uh, this is what I call social security part two, or let's call it advanced social security. Um, in this presentation, I'll take 15 minutes uh, at the beginning and I'll uh, run through uh, uh, a recap of Social Security 101. It's going to be quick, fast and furious. I encourage you, if you want to see the extended presentation on Social Security 101, uh, to go back to the YouTube channel and check out the presentation from Friday, or you can look at it from last October if you prefer. Uh, but this is really going into more claiming strategies and a couple of rules of thumb that you want to think about as you get closer to retirement age. And then the goal here is to really bring it all together so that you have not only social security, but how do you, how do you put all these different buckets together um, that you through your life of work that you generated to provide retirement income? And how do you, how do you think about them in the context? Uh, I like to call it mailbox money for our clients, but how do you tr go from, you know, earning a paycheck where you get paid uh, every two weeks, some of us monthly, bi-monthly, you know, weekly, whatever happens to be, how do you turn that into a stream of income? And what are the ways that we can be the most tax efficient um, what is the value of a different type of dollar, our pensions, our IRAs, our 401ks, 403b, 457, Roth IRA, maybe brokerage or trust accounts, and Social Security, and how does that fit into the equation? So that's what we're here to discuss today. Uh, this presentation is for you. Uh, it's not for me, so I will monitor the chat box here. I'm going to put the chat box over in the corner of my screen here. Um, <clears throat> if you have any questions as we go along, again, this presentation is for you. Uh, I've given it now probably 500 times, so I'm pretty sure I know what I'm going to say, 
but it's always the questions that make this a really valuable session for everyone else. So please feel free to put something in the chat if you have something that you, you want to ask. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into the slides. As you probably already noticed, I, um, I tend to drink a, a lot of coffee during the day and I speak fast. So one of the other things is, that's probably the fighter pilot mentality in, in, in my head. If I'm going too fast, someone please just put in the chat box, hey, slow down a little bit. I'm happy to do that. There's a lot of material here. So I wanna make sure we get through all of it. Okay, fair, so all the ground rules are set. Uh, so <clears throat> here's the problem. People are hurting their retirements by making terrible costly mistakes, particularly social security. Next slide. And so here are the things that we need to know about social security, right? You have many claiming uh, options, decisions have far reaching consequences. Well, what does that mean? Uh, most simply, you have two different earners in the family or maybe you have one earner and one is not. Right, so I constantly sit with couples all the time, and a decision will be made by the husband or wife that's the higher income earner that affects the lower income earning spouse that could be detrimental to their future, and they're not even realizing they're doing it. So let's sort through that today. Um, remember that it impacts both spouses. Uh, I want to be very clear, Social Security, as long as people like myself are working and the millennials are working, all of you baby boomers are going to continue to collect Social Security because the money comes into the system and immediately gets paid out as benefits. Um, through what are called your FICA taxes. I'm sure many of you are, are well aware of that, what comes out of your paycheck uh, every month up to an income limit. Uh, and the benefits likely <clears throat> help family members down the road. And the bottom is important, I think, when it comes to Social Security. And I'll just say this once, I have literally given this lecture now for 12 years. Uh, I studied Social Security for about two years before that to, to really understand it. I, there's still things that trip me up. I would also like to include not just your friends, but potentially professionals in your life, lawyers, CPAs, I've given this lecture many times uh, to, to groups of CPAs, attorneys, uh, other financial advisors, uh, other investment professionals, and it's shocking how much misinformation in a world of disinformation and misinformation, how much is out there that is completely irrelevant to Social Security, and quite frankly, it's just erroneous, right? So I'm here today to give you the facts. Uh, and, and things that are supported. And most of it, uh, as you'll see in my sources, comes from the actuaries at the Social Security Trust Fund. All right, so next slide. <clears throat> so what do, what do most baby boomers wanna know, right? Will Social Security be there for me? How much can I expect to receive? When should I apply? How do I maximize my benefits? And then the last question, Social Security be enough to live on in retirement? Approximately one third of this country, their only income in retirement is Social Security. But for the average baby boomer who retires today, right, and there's 10,000 of you retiring or turning 65 every day, um, the average baby boomer, roughly one third to one half of their retirement income will come from Social Security. So this is a topic that I learned early in my financial planning career is very pertinent to really um, building comprehensive wealth management, comprehensive financial plan uh, and, and cash flow uh, retirement plans for, for clients in retirement. Because if you're taking one half, one third of their retirement and not even addressing it, it leaves a huge gaping uh, a gap in their overall cash flow retirement plan. So next slide. And as you'll see here in a second, most of you uh, are probably sitting there in Southern California in San Diego, which I'll be there tomorrow morning. Uh, I am here in Incline Village. It's beautiful Lake Tahoe behind me. And so I, um, <clears throat> it, one of the most important things about Social Security, if you are a resident of California, is the tax advantages that you get uh, in California from your Social Security benefit. And we'll go over that at the end. So let's go through understanding the value here. Next slide. I think we got one out of it. There we go. So let's go, actually, let's just go, we'll get to understanding value in a second here, but let's talk about the OASDI trust fund, which is old age survivor disability insurance trust fund, right? And it was created as an insurance a program in 1935, just, you know, again, this is the quick review of Social Security 101. If you want more, you can go back to the, the lecture on Friday, but created in 1935 under the New Deal as a safety net, primarily for spouses uh, and survivors. You know, if you think about the, the family in 1935, normal family in 1935, husband goes to work in the factory or the mill or whatever. Um, he has a pension, he dies, the pension dies with him, and it was leaving a lot of spouses and or survivors impoverished in, in their latter years. So this was part of the New Deal to get a safety net, uh, you know, to retirees uh, beyond a pension program from GM or whatever the company was at the time. All right. So in 2018, our total income to the trust fund, approximately $1.1 trillion. Total expenditures, just a little bit below that, $1.107 There was actually a net increase in assets in 2018 of $10.9 billion. 
So that on 12, 31, 20, and again, this is actually not 2018 results. This is 2020 results. I apologize. I, I forgot to change the number there on top left. Uh, and this is derived directly from the Office of the Chief Actuary. But uh, the Social Security Trust Fund is $2.9 trillion, that's trillion with a T, uh, balance right now in the trust fund. Next slide. So what has been the concern forever and ever and ever? Well, the actuary several years ago when I started giving this presentation said that the cost, right, the blue line was going to go over the income line in approximately uh, 2010, 2011. Well, here we are in 2022. And I just showed you numbers from 2020, and we had that little recession thing from the pandemic in 2020, which meant income to the Social Security Trust Fund should have been significantly lower um, because less people were working. There was severe unemployment at one point in this country in 2020. Uh, so you'd expect for the income to be below the, the payments, you know, especially with what we call the great uh, resignation or the great retirement, all these people moving into retirement early and or quitting their jobs simply wasn't the case, Okay. So the efficacy of the Social Security Trust Fund and the viability of it as a income source for retirees is very good, actually much better than the actuaries have predicted, okay? And without reform, they're still predicting benefits would fall to 79% in 2034. So if you're sitting around the dinner table or uh, hanging out playing you know, chess or whatever with your friends, um, you know, and they start telling you about how Social Security is a Ponzi scheme and it's going bankrupt, uh, you can simply say that's impossible because as long as there's a single millennial, a single, I'm Generation X, Gen X, millennial, I don't even know what the new ones are, what, Gen Z or something like that. As long as they're out there working, they're paying their FICA taxes, right? And then the benefits are immediately turned around and paid out. And we have this almost $3 trillion trust fund uh, sitting there waiting in balance, right? So to pay out benefits. So at the bottom line, next slide, is I tell my baby boomer clients that more likely than not, you're not gonna have any issue. Here are some of the reform proposals. Uh, you know, one of them here at the top, increasing the maximum earnings of Social Security tax. It, well, look, that's raised every year since I've been giving this presentation. So that's already in effect. Normal retirement age has already gone. It started out in 1935 at 65. Then it went to 66. Then they stepped it up uh, between 40, 1940, <clears throat> excuse me, 1954 and 1960. And it's 67 for those of us 19, say, born in 1960 or later. And I would expect to see that continue out for uh, the millennials, Gen Z, et cetera, et cetera. Lower future benefits for future retirees. Well, you know, politi politically, this would be uh, the, the nail in the coffin, right? If you are uh, a politician that would like to keep your job, uh, the worst thing you could probably do is take retirement income or piss off the highest voting percentage of the populace per, you know, per capita, right? Uh, I think you'd be out of office, uh, you know, the next day you'd be recalled, right? So I don't see this as a viable solution. And reducing the cost of living adjustments, well, that it should be more act to be more accurate. They've considered changing it from CPIW, which is consumer price index for working individuals. You probably notice every October they come out, they announce what the COLA is going to be for the following year, the increase in benefits for the next year are. And they also give you part B and part D uh, premiums for Medicare, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of proposals out there to change it to what's called chained CPI, which is more, um, covers more retiree type of benefits than CPIW, which is for working individuals. The bottom line is none of these proposals have moved through Congress in any type of efficient or uh, bipartisan manner. So the only one of these I see, or the only two of these I really see happening are the first two, right? Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see the, the first one, the top one, the amount of your wages subject to Social Security increase significantly, particularly with the current inflation rates we're dealing with in the general economy. Next slide. Yep, just like I said. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> What's clear way to think about it? Let's go to the next slide, please. So it's inflation protected income. And I, I think this is really important because you think about your pension at UCSD. And for those of you that are new, uh, every fall I do a review of the pension plan at UCSD and uh, the Fidelity uh, 403B, 457, all that stuff. So if that's something uh, that you, know, you want an outside eye on, um, or, you know, to get a third party other than the Fidelity folks to talk about, you're more than welcome to join that. But what I will say is your inflation, last time I checked anyways, with your pension plan is step for step for the first 2%. But if you get high inflation rates, like 6 7%, like we have right now, which we haven't seen in decades, right, 40 years almost, um, you get, I believe it's a quarter percent for every percent above 2% in the inflation rate. Social Security is not that way, right? Social Security, you get it step for step because it's based on CPIW. So you're more likely to get a, 
a, a commiserate uh, step up in your social security benefits than you are with your pension in the UC system, right? So that right there makes me think of your social security dollar is worth slightly more than your pension dollar. When we get to the taxation, you'll see why it's much more valuable than your pension dollar. Not to say there's anything wrong with UC pension. It's a great pension plan. It's the third largest you know, pension system, I think, in the country. I know it is in California behind CalPERS and CalSTRS, and it's probably the best funded of the three of them. Next slide. So again, it gives you, you know, income you, you can't outlive, right? Guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. And that's another thing I think you, you need to consider because you think of a UC pension, what is that backed by? You know, if you go down to it, the brass knuckles is that it's backed by the California taxpayer, right? The California taxpayer, last time I checked, is pretty exhaustive, right? It's been taxed on pretty much everything. I just saw the proposal today that the governor uh, wants to give $400 credits for gas to everybody that owns a car in the state. You know, so I think, where's that money coming from? Obviously, the taxpayers. Um, so I think uh, from a taxation standpoint, or excuse me, <clears throat> from a, uh, a viability standpoint into the future, right? We have no idea what state finances are going to look like. There's obviously states that are in a lot more trouble in California. But the good thing about the federal government is it has 330 million people paying into the tax system, not 40 million, right? And so I think that's really important to consider when you talk about the safety of your Social Security income. So look at the bottom there, 30 years. So let's say you retire, you take Social Security at, um, at uh, well, this would be if your monthly benefit is 2,000 a day and you live 30 years, you can see it's worth a bucket in retirement of 1.1 million. And that's why I say, you know, for most baby boomers, you know, let's say you've been diligent and saved a lot of money in your uh, 403B, 457, you got a million or 2 million in there and you've got a nice pension, 50, 60, 70,000, 80, 100,000, whatever it is, the Social Security benefit can be huge. Just to give you an example, my father uh, retired from American Airlines in 2007. He's now 75. He uh, was under the old regime and filed and suspended and all that stuff. So both him and my stepmother um, are both collected their maximum benefits at age 70. And their combined Social Security income today is upwards of 60, 65,000 annually, which is a great benefit, right? Um, another interesting story there, my father was married previously to my mother uh, for 12 years. And because they had a long-term marriage, meaning 10 years or longer, my mother's entitled to all the same benefits my stepmother is. So she also collects off my dad's uh, benefit as well. We'll get a little bit more into that towards the end when we talk about uh, spousal and survivor benefits. Next slide. <clears throat> again, I'm moving fast here, but this is the recap of the uh, first presentation. So again, it's just more uh, income later dependent on when you collect. Next slide. All right, how, come, how much can we expect to receive in retirement? Next slide, please. Well, it's based on two things. One, you can't do anything about, and one, you can, right? You, how much you've earned over your working career, you can't go back in the past and you know, make more money you know, 15, 20 years ago, right? So it's really based on the age at which you apply for benefits, which is the focus of this presentation. Next slide. So how is it calculated? Does this really matter? No, because Social Security will do this for you. It's called the AIME. There's these three bend points. Anyone that tells you Social Security is not um, uh, means tested is wrong. Uh, the, the bend point is just based on the, the, the velocity or the, the steepness of the bend points. So your first 30, 35,000 in income gets you a significantly more of a future Social Security benefit than the last 30,000. Uh, like if you had 90,000 in income, the first 30,000 is on that first bend point. So it, it just provides a larger benefit. Again, that's not important to know, but I will tell you that Social Security is in its own way means tested. Next slide. Not necessary to know this formula. Next slide. Go back uh, again to the presentation on, on Friday if you like to. <clears throat> All right, so let's let's start getting more into the advanced stuff here. Minimize this. All right. So why should I not claim at, uh, sick? I'm just changing my, there we go, gallery there. Okay, next slide, please. Why should we delay? Well, your monthly benefit will be reduced if you claim early. There's something called the earnings test. Uh, I've got a slide here in a second on it, but it's 19,560 in 2022. So any income over that claiming prior to your full retirement age, they're going to take a dollar away for every $2 above that amount you have. All right. And so you can see uh, even a modest income, 50, 60,000, you are going to be um, more likely than not, your entire social security benefit will be taken away. And that's called the earnings test, right? Also, if you claim early, there's something called the actuarial reduction, right? Next slide. So let's talk about uh, when you should apply for benefits and what it depends on, health status, life expectancy, your need for income, whether or not you plan to work, and your survivor needs, right? 
All of these things are different for each and every one of you out there, but I am here to give you a couple of rules of thumb today. Uh, but again, each situation is very independent and it's very, um, it's, it's unique to each and every one of the individuals based on all these different things. Next slide. The bottom line, will Social Security be enough to live on retirement? I'm guessing if you're sitting here and you're uh, an employee, a retiree, whether Meritire or Retirement Association, probably not. Next slide. All right, so this is an important number to know. Take a screenshot of this or come back and review this, but your full retirement age, there's a lot of things that happen around what's called your full retirement age. If you're born prior to 1954, prior, the full retirement age is 66. Between 1954 and 1960, it steps up every two months, and then 1960 and later at 67. This is called your full retirement age. Also, uh, another term I use, PIA, primary insurance amount. That is the amount of your Social Security at your full retirement age. Full retirement age is very important because it is the time at which you are no longer subject to the earnings test. You can be Warren Buffett and make $100 million a year, or Elon Musk or whoever you like, and you still will collect your full Social Security benefit. And I say full based on when you uh, began claiming. Next slide. <clears throat> So what if you apply for early benefits? This is the actuarial reduction I was speaking about. And I'll just use the middle column there. So let's say my full retirement age is 66. I was born before 1954 before. And I decide to claim it 62 versus 66. I'm going to take a 25% haircut on my benefit, right? Uh, I still get my cost of living adjustment if I delay from 62 to 66. But you're getting a 25% rate of return from 62 to 66 if you just delay your benefit. Well, what if you wait longer? Next slide. If I wait longer, my full retirement age is 66, right? I get an 8% what's called a delayed retirement credit, a DRC. I get an 8% increase in my Social Security benefit every year I delay claiming after my full retirement age. <clears throat> what does that mean to you? Well, if the COLA has averaged 2.7% since 1982, 1983, and you get 8% increase on your Social Security benefit, that's approximately 11%, right? How many of you in the room here are getting a guaranteed 11% rate of return on your investments, particularly this year? What about 2022, right? So this is an 11% guaranteed rate of return, tax deferred, because you're not paying taxes on that, right? You're getting the COLA. <clears throat> I should say that, <clears throat> excuse me, the 8% is guaranteed. The COLA could be, like it probably will for this year, significantly higher, right? Or it could be lower in the year of, you know, dis or excuse me, of deflation, right? So I... This is one of the things that I tell folks when they think about claiming early. So, so what do we do, right? If you're 66 and you say, well, I, I kind of need the 2000 a month or 3000 a month or whatever your, your full retirement age, your primary insurance amount is. So, well, we have a strategy for that, right? And we'll go over that here in a second. Next slide. So if you just want to get your estimate, you can go to ssa.gov. Um, remember that the estimate, next slide, that they give you is not accurate except for one day. And that day is the day at which you turn 62, and then they give it to you, and it looks something like this right here. And let's say my full retirement age is 67, so I'm born 1960 or later, right? And if I'm looking at that statement today, and it says 62, you could see the left column, the third column there, and the fourth column, the benefit without COLA and the benefit with COLA, okay? And you could see the difference as you go down to 70. On your statement from Social Security, you would say your benefit at 70 is 34.72, because Social Security does not add in that compounding COLA because they do not do an estimation of a COLA, whereas in our program, we can do that. We can estimate a COLA. We can use 2.6%. We can use a much higher rate if you want to use it for the higher inflation we're experiencing now. There's a lot of different things you can do for the program, but it's important to note there's a substantial difference. You can see at 70, if you're looking at your benefit at 62, and you just look down, you look at the difference between what you would see on your Social Security statement and what your true benefit would be at 70. It's almost $1,000 a month. That's a pretty substantial difference. And you also have to remember, if you're the primary breadwinner in a family, as we'll talk about here in a second, and you wait to 70 to collect that benefit, you're leaving a survivorship benefit that's 100% of your benefit as long as your surviving spouse collects your survivor benefit at full retirement age or later. And that's really important when it comes to protecting a spouse you know, in, in her or his 70s, 80s, and 90s. Next slide. Um, you know, I think I touched on this, but you delay benefits for, for bigger benefits later on. Next slide. 
So how can we maximize benefits? Now we're getting into part two here. Well, the first thing you can do is you can go review your statement at ssa.gov. Is it accurate? Are there missing years? Can I go back, show tax returns where the uh, Social Security Administration missed? Because remember, our benefits determined on our top 35 years of earnings. So if you have 30 years of earnings on your earnings statement and you have zeros for the last five, if you could find any earnings from any employment there, it's going to raise your Social Security benefit. Next slide. Also, you know, you saw on the bottom there, it says, you know, can I work longer? That's usually the one answer no one wants to hear, right? Nobody wants to work any longer than they have to. Um, so applying for Social Security is optimal time. Consider income needs, life expectancy, and the bottom one is really important. If you're married, have a domestic partner, you know, any type of relationship uh, of, that the IRS, uh, not the IRS, excuse me, SSA recognizes as a, as a marriage. So it could be a domestic partnership as well. Um, <clears throat> they are, excuse me, a same-sex partnership as well. Um, you need to consider your spouse's life expectancy as well when it comes to the claiming decision. Next slide. And one more. This is really, really important on taxation. So this is the earnings test and the number there, that's 2019. I took the number down for 2022. It's 19,560. Remember, it's going to be reduced. The benefit will be adjusted at full retirement age. If they take that away, you'll get the COLAs. Um, to avoid an earnings test, you need to wait to full retirement age or later to apply for your benefits. Next slide. Here is something extremely important when it comes to understanding the value of Social Security. If you're married filing joint, right, so the highest tax bracket for Social Security, I, I'm guessing there's going to be very few people in the 25 to 34,000 or less than 25,000 or zero to 25,000. That's um, these numbers were regenerated in 1982 or 83 when they updated Social Security, and <clears throat> they never indexed these for inflation. So pretty much everybody follows into the fa falls into the highest uh, bracket for Social Security taxation, but it's really important to know that at the federal level, you see up to 85%. At the federal level, 85 cents on the dollar is taxed at your ordinary income level. 15 cents on the dollar is taxed at zero. And does anyone in here know what p the taxation of Social Security is at the state level in California? <clears throat> It's real easy. It's zero, right? California does not tax Social Security benefits, which is a huge advantage, right, when it comes to taxation and the value of Social Security and what it is. Next slide. <clears throat> so ways, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> ways to minimize taxes on Social Security benefits. So what are some tactics that you can do here? Well, you can reduce other income with tax advantage investments. Uh, remember, municipal bonds go into the, the figure, the modified adjusted gross income figure. So munis do not help you hide from taxation on Social Security benefits. Although, like I said, most of you are going to be in that top bracket anyways. Uh, anticipating IRA RMDs uh, is something I'll talk about here in a second when I go through uh, an advanced strategy for, for retirement distributions. Converting traditional IRA to Roth. I'm not a big fan of this, actually. Uh, I should probably remove this eventually, but I always mention it. Uh, in California, where we're the most progressively taxed state in the union, it just doesn't make sense most of the time to do a lot of Roth conversion because you have to pay ordinary income taxes on the IRA conversion. Uh, delaying Social Security reduces the number of years your benefits are subject to tax, and you know uh, you can certainly look at annuities and other things like that. Next slide. Uh, remember also Medicare can shrink your check, right? You have the Part B premium that comes out. Once you uh, apply for Social Security, your Part B premium, which as of 2020 is $170.10, um, will come out, and that's assuming you're not subject to what's called the IRMA, the Income Related Monthly Adjustment. Uh, if you've never heard of that term before, I highly encourage you to check out my Medicare presentation for Monday, where I go over the IRMA and exactly what it is and ways to avoid it and ways to uh, consider it in your retirement distributions. Next slide. Uh, so just, you know, key points to remember when you're applying for Social Security, apply early, your benefits stay lower for life, right? That's that actuarial reduction. COLAs magnify the impact or early or delayed claiming. The longer you live, the more beneficial it is to delay benefits, right? I know none of, none of us in here know exactly how long we're going to live, but we have an idea from family and our health, et cetera, et cetera. So you certainly want to consider the magnification of those COLAs on your benefit if you decide to delay. Benefits may be tax reduced to cover your Medicare premiums. Don't let the earnings test discourage you from working, and delaying benefits may give your surviving spouse more income. That's that survivor business shift that we talked about. Next slide. Next slide. 
Again, this is where we get into the couples. You should always maximize the higher earning benefit to protect a surviving spouse. This is the first rule of thumb that I give you for couples. And I'll repeat, you should always maximize the higher earner's benefit to protect the surviving spouse. Doesn't matter who's older or who's younger, the higher earning spouse should almost, almost always delay as long as they can, that's 70. There's no benefit in, in delaying past 70 to protect the younger spouse or older spouse that had lower earnings and lower benefit. Next slide. So here are the rules for spousal benefits. The primary worker must have filed for their own benefit. The spouse must be at least 62 for a reduced. There's a reduction, an actual reduction in spousal benefits as well. Uh, if they want the full spousal benefit, they have to wait to FRA. There are no delayed retirement credits on spousal benefits. So the maximum spousal benefit is at full retirement age. Next slide. Let's do uh, coordinate spousal benefits. We're going to go through a couple examples here. Next slide. All right, so here's one maximization strategy where a lower earning spouse's primary insurance amount is more than 50% of the higher earning spouse, primary insurance amount. Both spouses delay to age 70. One spouse takes advantage of spousal benefits as allowed, uh, not really allowed anymore. That, that fell under the file and suspend or restricted application. Both of those were eliminated in 2016. And then you're maximizing the lifetime benefits over average or long life expectancies, right? Now, again, this is dependent on projected life expectancies. Next slide. A hybrid strategy, <clears throat> if the lower earning spouse's primary insurance amount is less than 50% of the higher earning spouse's primary insurance amount, the lower earning spouse then claims early, that'd be age 62, and the higher earning spouse claims at 70, again, protecting the lower earning spouse through the survivor benefit. It generates a little bit of income sooner while maximizing the higher earning spouse benefit over both lifetimes. Next slide. These are the, uh, the analysis we do it, within UCSD uh, for the retirement and the emeritus associations uh, and anyone that's a member of the RRC, we do this pre uh, social security analysis just, just to kind of look at what they look like. And what happens is we take your primary insurance amount and a little bit of the information that's on a questionnaire. Suzanne has those questionnaires. She can send them out or put them in the chat or wherever you want to do it from Suzanne. They were but, sent uh, out to everybody for, who signed up. Perfect. So <clears throat> those questionnaires just need to be filled out, returned to us. Uh, we pump out your social security analysis, giving you the different things, walk you through it for about five minutes, 10 minutes, and then uh, off to the races you go. So, and again, that's only free to uh, the Retirement Emeriti Association RRC members. Next slide. One more, please. So touch real quick here on survivor benefits. Your widow divorce you can be eligible for survivor benefits, divorce benefits. Divorce spouse benefits increase your monthly check. Next slide. So survivor benefits, I normally just gloss over them because they're actually very difficult. Survivor benefits can be claimed as early as age 60. Uh, what they are dependent on is this special formula, uh, either if it's prior to uh, FRA, 82.5% of the primary insurance amount. Once they cross that threshold, then it's the actual amount up to um, the full retirement age, if claimed after full retirement age, it includes delayed retirement credits. It's very, very complex. We have a calculator for it. I walk you through it. We rarely have survivors on here that are currently survivors, but it's something to think about down the road. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Just a quick example on survivor benefits. Joe and Julia married. Both are over full retirement age. Joe's benefits 2000. Julie's is 1200. Joe passes away. Julie does not get her own benefit plus the survivor. She just simply moves from the 1200 to 2000. Okay. So she now takes over Joe's benefit because he was the higher income earner. Next slide. So here's delayed claiming Joe and Julie are married. Joe's primary insurance amount is 2000. He filed for social security at 70. His benefits 132% of 2000 or 2640 plus he'd also get COLAs, but for this example, we're not doing that. And then Joe dies. Julie's survivor benefit will be equal to Joe's benefit of 2640, right? Dependent on when she claims. She claims at full retirement age or later, which is the bottom example there, right? She gets the full 2640. If she claims very early at 60, she would get 71.5% or 1887. Now, where this is important is what is Julie's benefit? If Julie has a very large benefit on her own, you have to compare what her benefit at age 60 would be, then switching to her own at 70, right? Or does she claim that she start her on her own benefit at 62 and then switch to survivor benefit at 66? If you're confused, 
good. That's why you have an expert to help you out and get through these different iterations. I'm telling you, survivor benefits are incredibly complex, uh, as are spousal as well. And remember, spousal, you cannot take a spousal benefit until age 62. That's different from survivor at age 60. Next slide. A um, couple of rules around survivor benefits. Uh, must have been married for at least nine months at date of death. Survivor must be at least 60 for the reduced benefit. There is a provision for disability. Survivor benefit not available if the widow remarries before age 60, something to think about. And divorce spouse benefits available to marriage last at least 10 years. Again, the spousal and survivors all based on 10 years, unless you're currently married and it's less than 10 years. Next slide. So again, a divorce spouse, just like I gave the example of my uh, mother and my father, their marriage lasts more than 10 years. So she's eligible for all of my dad's benefits. Um, you know, for those that don't have a good relationship, a person receiving divorce spouse benefits is currently unmarried and there's no notification of an ex-spouse. So if you're sitting in this and you're divorced and you had a you know, rough separation, divorce, whatever it happens to be, and you don't want your ex-spouse knowing where you are or that you're claiming off of them, Social Security Administration will not notify them whatsoever. And the other part of it as well is if you think your spouse is purposely ex-spouse, purposely not claiming to prevent you from claiming, that's not the way it works either. I always tell people, if you really wanted a way around the Social Security Administration and you're about the same age, you just get divorced at your full retirement age or right about your full retirement age, and you collect a divorced spouse uh, benefit off of them, and then you switch to your own at age 70. That's one way around uh, all these rules within Social Security. But you know, a lot of people don't want to go through the trouble of getting divorced in their golden years. Um, and that's kind of a joke. It's a lot funnier in person, apparently, than on Zoom. Next slide. All right, rules for divorce spouse. Uh, you know, one of the great rules here is if, let's say I was Johnny, um, Johnny Carson, married four different times, each time more than 10 years, I think it was. Uh, all four of his ex-spouses are eligible for all the same benefits off of his benefit, right? Benefits paid to one ex-spouse do not affect those paid to the worker, and they don't affect a current spouse or other ex-spouses, right? Next slide. All right. Yes, this is more complicated than you realize. Right, next slide. I think we're getting to the part where I'm going to share my screen. All right, so B delay, B delay, penalty, or get a bonus. Next slide. All right, so this is pretty much the end of the slide. Now I'm going to get to the point, uh, if you don't mind, Suzanne, give me control so I can uh, share my screen. And I'm going to share with you what I think is the most important thing about Social Security and understanding its true value. This is the, the meat and potatoes here. And this is all based off of a paper that was published in 2007 called Rethinking Social Security Claiming in a 401k World. It was published at this mediocre business school called the Wharton School of Business, just uh, over in the Pennsylvania area, I believe. And it was uh, uh, written by two uh, members of the Pension Research Council. And what they did is they put together um, this, this paper on studying the actual uh, uh, benefits of Social Security claiming early versus late, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Vanya, is it Vanya's screen? Uh, do you mind sharing the, so I can share my screen here? Oh, there we go. Nope. Yeah, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna get to the whiteboard here. <clears throat> and what I wanna show you here on the whiteboard is, let's, let's talk about you know Joe and Mary retirement here. And if I can get my, I have a little issue with my draw. There we go. Okay, here we go. Now it's not letting me do it with my finger. Okay, so let's assume this is retirement here for someone. What the, and if you guys don't mind using the chat because I can't see all of you right now. Um, let's, if you don't mind, let's make this a little participatory. Um, put in the chat a couple sources of income in retirement. Just, just go ahead and be adventurous and put a couple down there for me. Oh, there you go. Pension. Perfect. Thank you, Mel. All right. So pension is one. What else? What are other sources of retirement income? Fidelity. Okay. Anybody else besides I want to participate today? Just, just once. I promise I won't. I will start calling on people if I have to. Social Security. Thank you, Suzanne. Social Security, which we're discussing today. All right. She said fidelity. Let's just call that an IRA. Let's assume you take your 403B, 457, DCP, all that good stuff, 
and you combine it into an IRA, all right? What else, anyone else? Rental income, yeah, that's another good source. What about a brokerage account or like a trust account? I'll just put a T here, right? Because you, you save money, you, know, you save half a million or something like that in the trust account, maybe proceeds of a, a rental property or something like that. Um, so this all goes into, right? Our, why my screen is, my mouse is being so weird. Let's try this. There we go. So this is our mailbox, right? And so this is our monthly paycheck, okay? In retirement, we've got our pension. How is a, how is the pension taxed at the federal level? Anyone? You want a tax expert out there by chance? How's our pension taxed at the federal and the state level? Ordinary income. That's right. I think Suzanne's been to this before. Ordinary <laughs> income. For every dollar that comes out of the pension, so I'll say 22% Fed. That depends on your tax bracket. But this is ordinary income. So that could be as high as 37% in today's tax world, right? Depending on your income, right? And is could be as high as hard to believe, but it's true. Could be as high as 13.3 in California. Those would be tops top tax brackets. I'm assuming there's not many people in here that are in those brackets, but that's the potential, right? Um, more likely than not, like Elle said, you're going to probably see something in the 22 range and nine in California. So your IRA, how is that taxed? When you take a dollar out of your IRA, I can help out Suzanne. We don't have a very participatory group today. So that's also ordinary income, all right? Well, our trust account, how is that taxed? Well, we got to put a line in the middle here because at the state level, California does not recognize any capital gains or dividends and anything. So California is ordinary income. At the federal level, we could have some tax benefits if it's a uh, you know, div qualified dividend or a long-term capital gain versus a short-term capital gain, it could potentially be taxed differently. How about Social Security? Well, let's put that line again. So remember that whole 85 cents on the dollar, right? So that 85 cents on the dollar is taxed at ordinary income. But remember, you got that 15 cents that's not taxed at all, zero. And at the state level, we're at a big fat donut. So is it easy to see right away that this right here, a dollar from here is worth more, certainly more than here, certainly more than here, right? And potentially, and more likely than not, worth more than here. Oh, by the way, this is guaranteed 100% by the full faith and credit of the United States government also comes with 100% survivorship. And while you're deferring social security in your 60s to maximize it at 70, you don't pay a single dollar of tax. Now, most importantly, right? When it comes to fidelity, that 403B and 457, do they charge any fees or expenses in any of those funds? Do you maybe have to pay a financial advisor for anything? That's a big yes, by the way. Even if you do all yourself and it's all index funds, everything, there is always a cost to the management of investments, okay? Pension, is there a cost? <clears throat> well, kind of. Technically, there is, but you don't really see it. And then, of course, there's the same cost from the IRA here. What's the cost for Social Security to electronically deliver that money to your bank account on a monthly basis? What, what do you pay in investment fees and expenses there? That's right, Al. Zero. Well, at least that's somebody that participates. A big fat donut. Okay. So not only from a taxation standpoint, all the other things I've mentioned, Social Security more valuable, but investment fees and expenses here are Zippo, zilch. Right. Now I'm going to erase all this. I forgot how to do it. I don't know why. It seems like I'm in a different. Oh, it's clear. There we go. All right. So in retirement, our dream retirement goal, right, is to have a portfolio that just kind of does this, right? Very little, very little oscillation as we, you know, take money out to fund our mailbox money, maybe at 72, maybe even delaying the whole time. We start having those things called RMDs, right? And we start taking money out on a yearly basis. Right. And so we want a pretty smooth rise. Right. We don't want to take a lot of risk as we get older and older in retirement. But the bottom line is, right, especially if you have that IRA. OK. Right now, anyone seen over the last uh, six months 
what just owning something like a 10-year treasury has done. When the interest rate has gone from 1.4% in the fall to, I believe we closed right about 2.34 today. Anybody know what that means, right? Remember how bonds work? If this is a teeter-totter on bonds, one side you have interest rate, and the other side you have price, okay? As interest rates go up, guess what happens to the value of your bonds? They go down. And treasuries are down over 10% since last fall, right? So now, and let's say you're investing nothing but stocks. Well, we know at one point this year, the NASDAQ was down 22%, the S&P 500, and its nadir was down about 15 16%, and the Dow is down about 12%, 13%. So now really what's happening is your portfolio is looking something like this in retirement, right? Which is not what you want to have, right? So what is a way to reduce your expenses in retirement and get more into this type of portfolio than this type of portfolio right here, where you're taking out money on these downturns as well as you are on the rips, right? You're doing the rips and the dips. It's by simply exchanging a social security dollar, a later social security dollar, for a current day IRA dollar, okay? What am I advocating? I am advocating that you draw down on this during your 60s, when you retire at 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, whatever it happens to be, and you're delaying that Social Security. Remember from 62 to 66, if that's your full retirement age, you get a 25% increase. Sorry about my writing, I'm writing with my mouse. Increase in Social Security from 66 to 70. Anybody remember what that DRC is per year? Anyone? Not all at once. Anyone? 11 Thank you. 8% plus what Suzanne's referring to, the cost of living adjustment. Average 2.6% since 1983. More likely than not this year going to be 5, 6, 7%. Right? That's a 13, 14%, 15% potential increase in Social Security. Are you guys invested in your IRAs to get 15, 20% returns year over year? I, I would, first of all, I would hope not at your age, but I, I would doubt it, right? So I think it's important to understand that as we go through retirement and we want to become more conservative, we want lower fees and expenses, we want more certainty. By exchanging a dollar out of your IRA today for a future Social Security dollar, you are not only making your portfolio safer, more concrete, you're also reducing your future expenses and lowering your future required minimum distributions. So why haven't you heard this from you know, someone in my business or your accountant or CPA? Well, the problem is, you know, in our business, we get paid on these IRAs, right? We get paid as a, you know, value assets under management, all that stuff, as does Fidelity, as does Vanguard, all that stuff. And I'm not saying that people are purposely not giving you this information. What I'm saying is I don't think people have really thought about it. And again, that is what, and I'm going to go ahead and clear this out, clear my whiteboard, I'm going to go back. And that is, in my opinion, the number one reason to delay Social Security in retirement. I want you to think about this real quick, and I will end with this and open for questions. You are exchanging a dollar, a variable dollar that's invested in the market that has risk, that has investment fees and expenses, that has no guarantees whatsoever, okay? money you've saved all your life it's also being taxed at ordinary income both at the federal and state level and as you exchange those dollars for a future social security dollar down the road you're becoming more tax efficient your portfolio is becoming more stable you're lowering your fees and expenses and reducing your future required minimum distributions in my opinion that is good financial planning and that is sound advice for people as they age through their retirement okay and i think uh, that's something that's often lost in my profession, and I highly encourage you to think of Social Security that way. Again, inflation-protected income, guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, tax-advantaged, 100% survivorship, reduced fees and expenses, and I will conclude with that. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope we have some questions here. Uh, I'll stick around as long as you need me.